Welcome back to the shop, Christmas break edition. We've got a bunch of little projects going, uh, some of which I'll cover with a video, some of which I won't. But when we're home for the holidays, it just means that we're working on the house for the holidays. We've got a door opening that I put here. This was a rental property. Uh, my fiance moved in. It's part of our home now, so I put this doorway in so that we could get back and forth between the spaces. The, the, the doorway wasn't here when it was a rental unit. Um, it's a rough opening in a two by six wall. The two by six being for privacy purposes. There's two layers of drywall on it. On that side and there were gonna be two layers on this side. Um, but I may or may not change that. The point is, it's got a jam in it already. Even though the jam doesn't um, go to the face here flush the way that it should, none of this is going to stay. Um, it needs some work, but for now, we're tired of closing it off with this curtain, basically. Oh, look who it is. Because Mr. Morty doesn't respect the curtain. We need a real door here. It's a 32-inch opening. Um, or excuse me, it's for a 32 inch door, so it measures out 34. I think we're at 32 and a little bit now with the inch and a half on it from the jam. But I'm trying to do this on the cheap. I, I could go out and buy a secondhand interior, and I'd like a full light door just because if we're going to do it temporary, I don't want to fully um, phone it in. I'll at least put a full light door there, which is what we intend to have in the future. We intend to have a full pair of French doors with a transom. So because that's the idea, it'll be fun to sort of see it half realized. It'll be f more fun because I own this full light interior door slab to begin with. The problem is it measures at 30 inches wide. So the title of the video, um, you know, was in reference to how are we going to stretch this door slab? How are we going to make this wider? Obviously, we're not going to stretch it. We're going to add some wood on both sides of it. But to begin with, we're going to take off this mortise style latch and we're going to fill this it's going to be a painted door application so though we'll take the paint off of it it's being painted in the end so it won't matter that we've added an inch um, worth of lumber on both sides it won't matter that we fill the mortise um, openings in it with bondo or some such thing and the bottom has some issues um, with structural integrity so it, we won't necessarily have two vertical styles and uh, the lower rail the way a door normally has, we might cut this right off and add a solid piece horizontally to the whole thing um, because getting into the joinery that you need to actually make an extension of this rail that puts it back to good condition um, is more than I'm willing to do. Anyway, I just wanted to start at the beginning, which is missing glass and stuff. We're going to try and power plane the edges of this off, which I'm glad I fixed that power planer. Um, we're going to power plane it until the mortises for the hinges are gone, which is a little more than an eighth of an inch, at least on this side. We're going to put a fresh edge and take the paint off with the power plane on this side. That's after all the hardware is gone. And then we will cut down some one inch thick pieces that are just a hair bigger than we need and do a nice lamination to, to both of them with... Um, probably with fasteners as well. And once we're at that point, we're going to see if we can't send it. We'll go back to Braun and send the whole thing through a thickness sander that will take those overly big pieces down to the same surface as the rest of the door. Glass and all hopefully can go right through that planer and obviously won't be touched because the surface of the planer is out here sanding on this stuff. Um, but in the end, the idea is that it can be painted and really no one will be the wiser. And I'll just be out the cost of having it power sanded, thickness sanded, and I'll do the rest of it myself. All right, come back and see us when we've made a little progress. Thanks for watching. All right, I can't remember if we looked at this already, but we got the sides of the door sliced off. I just sent it through the table, saw nothing special. Got some burn marks on it here. Uh, I could totally feel that. Um, it's just something that everywhere else I go has a nicer setup for big millwork operations than I have, and I just can't get over... Um, trying to do them here which is like someday the outfeed table will actually be coplanar with the rest of the table saw and etc anyway this is quickly turning into a shit box hack job way of doing this um jeremy uh had a few hours at home the guy that works for me in his wood shop he ripped up some i think this is ash it smells like it uh, uh ripped up some uh four, i think it's five quarter uh, originally it's got a I don't know if you can see this it's a bit of you know there's texture there and we're just uh, power planing it now that the power plane is back up and running into something a little bit smooth like that on both sides there are a couple of spots that I'm just not willing to keep here's one I'm just not willing to keep going I don't know if you can see that Ooh. anyway there's just a little low area there 
Might be able to see it in the edge. Um, this isn't, again, it's not fine woodwork. It's a real nasty, gnarly um, areas of these pieces. We're just trying to bulk up and add width to this, obviously. So we're going to do the last stick here, both sides. And then the, I think the question is, because when you have a, uh, glass lights in the door, glass panes, this is the millwork side. It has a, a profile. And the other side should be removable pieces of window stop. Looks like, is it this side or the other side? Anyway, they ought to come out of there so that you can repair the glass. Um, anyway, we're going to have to put all four of these additional pieces, do our best to make them pick a side, one or the other, to make the sides of it, you know, flush or just a little bit proud um, and have everything else along to the other side because they're generally the same size, but we don't want them on there skewed or putting that whole assembly through something designed to make it all one thickness. It'll be all, t by the time they get down through the extra material to the surface here, the the route that it takes through there will be skewed and then the door will be getting sanded uh, all fakakta. And so we're going to do what we can here that though, you know, despite the fact that we've got a little more than we need in every aspect, that we justify them all to one side so that um, we can send it through with that side up probably a couple of times and you know get to a point where we're happy with that being a flat surface then turn it over and put that um, down onto the track and let the, the extra overhanging meat on the other side come down and then finally the drum of the thickness sander will engage the whole plane the whole surface uh, this is all very theoretical. Maybe that whole thing will go right in the fucking fire pit when we're done. In fact, looking closely to see how we get the glass out, it may be a, may be a reason that four pieces are missing. One, two, three, four. Um, somebody established that they couldn't dig the trim edges out to re-glaze re the window because it's not glazed. It's got millwork on both. So I don't know. We shall see. Oh... All right, we got those planed up, got the type on red out. I just had a lot of it and a uh, chip brush. And I've been just uh, basically slathering it on to give you a sense of how thick my glue is. I mean, there's some drips here, you know, initially. That's the thing is there'll be more when you start to squeeze. Um, I'm going to do things like cheat that knot off the end down here. So long as I got stuff, yeah, I got something here. And I just have the four clamps. So we're going to throw, and they're not all the same style. I have these these beautiful parallel, these Bessie clamps. Um, and then I have some of these, you know, add to your style or add to your choice uh, pipe. I'll throw those on through the top one, too. And I'll have it at like just in from both ends and then kind of divide it into thirds between. Um, and then I still don't like, I was thinking just now, if I still don't like what I'm seeing, my first thought was shooting nails through. Um, but the, I, can, I can dig them out, but this is hardwood and that becomes an issue. Then you have even more of a repair. Anyway, if something like this, three and a half or four inch screws, I'll just run through half, three and a half, four inch screws um, down tightly to hold the glue up. Then I'll back them off. I can take those right out. We'll do all of the machining operations um, and a little bit of filler. There'll be filler, you know, in those holes. And then there'll be filler at the bottom of the door here all along where this is bad. And uh, this, you know, veneer I think is going to let go here, but we'll be inside of this, and it's really easy to float that plane across with some literally fucking bondo. That's what I'm going to use. I thought about hacking this off. I think I said and putting a whole new piece of wood in here, but then you've got this has a profile here between the style and the rail, lower rail, um, the way that a door is constructed. So then it's like a question of do I do the glue up now, cut cross cut everything off, and add a piece across the end with so there's end grain, or do I put that cut this just off the door, put that onto the end grain, um, butts up to these additional pieces here. Next thing you know, you get all these operations, all these glue operations. All that would have to be a piece of softwood, unless I wanted to go out and buy a crazy piece of hardwood that nobody had. This here was something Jeremy had, um, or I could, like I said, I have softwood around. But then you've got a piece of yellow pine. An oak door, uh, uh, again, s trying to do a sketchy, s disgusting job on something that'll be painted out. And um, 
and probably not stay ver around very long. Who knows? Half the time when I do a half-ass job like this that I set out to do half-ass from the beginning, it turns out better than something I tried to be a nice, you know, try and do a nice job on. So we'll see. Anyway, we're going to glue, the, we're going to clamp this now. We'll feel of our, we're, you know, the idea being that as these clamps sit on the table and as their backbone sits on the table, uh, all these items as they sit, at least at this backbone location, in theory it's pretty flush. But these here wander and so you've got some, you know, we'll have to push down. You don't have to gain like that or lose, depending as I clamp the other two times. Um, and then the screws will just touch up the clamp for us, but hopefully I should be right where I want to be at that point. And again, that means that the bottom surface here will be as close to planar as we can get with a lamination, which is not very tight. Um, but that'll be um, a surface that I can hand plane and then sand in one go. And then that'll be a reference surface to plane down this overly long. Look at we got three eighths of an inch or more, you know, extra wood material here. I may hand plane that down to really close to the surface here, all in an in an effort, you know, and then belt sand it until I'm just kissing this paint job. I mean, the paint's got ten thousands of an inch on the wood here, so I'll probably dial everything in by hand and by touch and by power t tool here, and just you know, obviously lop the extra off. And then we'll go down to Braun Millwork and see if he wants to bring this in for a landing for us. We've come back from Braun Millwork, and uh, this is looking really nice. There's some low areas, like this here, uh, which are no problem. We'll use straight-up Bondo. There's some areas where the wood that Jeremy was nice enough to rip up for me uh, was cost-effective because it had, like, just blemishes and stuff that we'll fill. Got a little wet on the way home. Um, you know, but all in all, this is exactly what I wanted. And this is where you can see, you know, had I been really meticulous about the wood that I, you know, if I got quarter sawn oak and stuff and we didn't have, you know, knots and it wasn't the wrong species, you wouldn't have known given the grain in here. I could have, essentially what I'm saying is it might not have needed to have been painted. However, I will say it's veneer. The door is solid wood, but it's not as old as I would have thought because of, uh, I guess you can't see it on this side. We sanded through the veneer on the other side only? We sanded through the veneer on the other side only. Um, we'll probably look at that too. Anyway, for right now, we've got uh, mortise um, openings in the in the hardwood. They go right on through. I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, I put some packaging tape, just ordinary, um, just stuck a piece on the bottom of it. And we're just going to pour this up until it's flush with some two-part casting resin, um, some urethane like you've seen me use before. So uh, uh, just a real quick spiel on this. Um, this is a smooth on product. It's uh, 325, which has a pot life of two and a half minutes and is cured after after 10. Two, uh, 327 I also have, that's like a pot life of 10 minutes and cured after two to four hours. I'm not in a really big hurry here, but I thought, you know, it'll be cool to watch. Um, when it comes to, to filling things up with resin, you don't want to use a laminating resin. Um, sort of, I don't want to go off on a tangent here too far, but I've got like um, an epoxy system from Smooth on here for laminating with fiberglass. It's They're metered pumps, one pump of catalyst, one pump of base. The volumes are in the right ratio, so you can come up and do five parts of base, five pumps of catalyst, and you'll have, you know, for however much volume you want. The point is that's meant to cure in a thin layer, just like any of your other, I don't know if I have them in here, like polyesters and stuff like that for basically the automotive store for laminating. Uh, it's chemically designed to cure in a thin layer and generate way too much heat uh, in, a, in a big volume. So anyway, the, the resins that are for casting create heat and cure, uh, but nowhere near in the amount that a laminating resin does. So to do a thin layer of these casting resins, you have a hell of a time getting it to cure, at least meeting the, the speeds the timeline on the jug, you won't get that from this. In a thin layer, it'll take longer. And the more heat you can give it, like with a work light or something, it'll go more quickly. Anyway, 
you want to avoid a laminating resin for cavity filling like this because that will be so fucking hot that it'll start fire uh, or at least smoke and stink and, and it'll be ruined. So for this we're going to do a quick 50-50, that's the ratio. I shook both parts up. More importantly the catalyst needs to be shaken, um, but it's always good to do both. I shook it like crazy. You don't want to not shake it because you'll pour resins and stuff off with solids missing that are sitting on the bottom from having set on the shelf. Um, and then even if you if you never remember to shake it, they'll be all fucked up. But even if you remember to shake it thereafter, you'll always have the wrong ratio of solids in here. And uh, you'll figure it all up. So you want to sh always shake it. And as far as a 50-50 mixture, it doesn't get much easier than that. Catalyst is always, the cap is always uh, crusty and stuck on just like five-minute epoxy. The catalyst has that issue. So I use a pair of, um, I use a pair of, Channel locks to open it, although it's all bring it up. Look at all those crusties falling out of there. All this. And by the way, if you don't get the pliers out first and you go after it, ooh. Well, if you get the pliers out and go after it, you'll pull the whole top out by accident. Um, but if you get the if you don't get the pliers out and go right after it, I've done that in the past. And this, these crystals and stuff are actually razor sharp in a lot of cases. And I'm gonna get two pairs of pliers. Anyway, I've sliced myself trying to open one of these before, and that also sucked. So the point is, if you can get to a, the level where you've got the container open, I didn't plan for this. This is what I hate about making a YouTube video. It's nothing ever goes the way you planned it. Stay in there. Dump the crusties out into the garbage can. All right. So pour out catalyst. That much is half the volume I want to make right now. Just eyeballing the cavity, and so then we want that much base. And to do two cups side by side makes it kind of easy to eyeball. That situation is pretty good there. It's also easy to stir. A little popsicle stick. I'll put the base in the catalyst first. And you want to pay attention to your cup sizes and how high you pour if you intend to use this method. Obviously, the sum of both amounts needs to be a bit less than the full volume of one container. This is the pour and pour back, pour back again method of mixture. So now I've got that in there. I'll put it back in this container and I'll get, I'll incorporate what was left on the sides of this container. I'll leave this one here. It also means that both containers um, kind of have a mixture. So that little film on the other cup will eventually cure instead of sitting there for forever uncured. And then you can take shop air and you can below that cured little film it'll let go of these polyethylene or polypropylene cups and that's where these came from that you'll notice the white shit in there is from painting their first life when they're perfect and brand new is for finished painting projects and then later for stuff like this when i don't care about contamination physical contamination of the shit i'll use them again and then i'll get rid of them eventually so then we'll pour this in and it'll rise up and then the tape will let go and it'll pour all all over the floor like when you put your fresh oil chin ch oil in your engine after you forget to put the plug back in the oil pan yep what did i tell you piss out on the floor there's a hole somewhere that i didn't realize Ooh, check that out you learn something every day it's actually the mortise is open to the crack where the glass goes so it won't hold any higher than that level. And um, it's pouring on the floor. So what I'll go ahead and do is wipe that up. <clears throat> and I'll have to fill that crack where the glass pane goes next time for the next pour. Um, and lesson learned. And actually we're gonna watch this 
puddle? Can you see it? There it is. I'm going to watch the puddle cure. And then when it's like a leathery kind of consistency before it's fully hard plastic, we will pop it off the floor, which I think is the best course of action. You think that you think of everything, but you don't. And then I'll trim this weight out of the middle so you don't have to sit and listen to me blather. That's fucking irritating. That is fucking irritating. I'm going to wipe his chin. So here's a good example of it being cold. The floor is pretty cold. I have a full basement, but it's winter time. So the floor is cold to the touch. The table is actually um, even sort of a product of it being a thin amount there and within the cavity where it's in a greater volume. I don't know if you can see. I don't know how to run this thing when you can see. Um, when it's in a greater volume, you can see that it's already white um, and it's setting up. This here's got some bubbles at its edges, but... This will be next, because it's about the same thickness, but the floor is cool and the table is probably, the table's probably 50 degrees or 55. The floor is probably 40, 45 degrees to the touch. Anyway. Oh, now I could top this off since that's poured out and cured on its way out. I believe it's going to stop, but who knows? We'll have to see. This is where it came out of. It came out of the crack in here where the glass goes. That I can reach right in to the mortise from there. The other thing is I don't want it to cure up in there too much because I want to be able to put a piece of glass back in the door. And I don't want it to build up on the outside too much because it's not supposed to have any dimension. It's supposed to be smooth. Oh, the best laid plans. Well, forget this. Well, we came home from Braun Mill work and had a pretty good um, base to start building back to what we want to have in this uh, in the doorway in the end here. We've got things down to clean wood all around, square, 32 inches wide, 80 inches long. Um, had these pieces, like I was saying, been nicer looking and had the goal been to have a naturally finished wood door, uh, we might have taken all the glass out and could have sandblasted or sanded this, um, these um, uh, mullions or whatever, not mullions, uh, muntins and the grid. Um, this is how you do that, by the way. So there are four pieces of window stop that go in here against the glass, which I removed to get the um, opening ready for the new pieces. These four were missing. And these are laying up here. Pretty typical, simple profile. I don't know if you can easily see it. It's a round. It's a, it's a you know, roll up to a little lip and a straight. Um, and they're on there with these little tacks. One, two, three. Looks like two per short side, three per long side. And this will make, you know, and there's glass, you know, stuck to this one from the pane that was broken. So those need to be processed, possibly replaced a few pieces. And then um, I'll probably paint those too while they're out and they're loose. And paint all around this glass. Just save myself cutting it around those panes if I can. I may have to come back and do a little bit. But anyway, um, down to mortising for these. These are just ever built brand cheap, chintzy, shitty hinges from Home Depot. Hinges though are pretty standard, so I could go to uh, it's probably one and a half by four, three screw hinge, you know, of of top quality in the future, and it ought to go. You know, right in place here. It's square corners, so I had to do a square cornered mortise. I guess I got to clean that one out a little bit. It's pretty easy. Laid them out six and a half inches from either end, which is just something I checked on another door, and then I put them on here in a way that they would sit on the ninety. Um, you know, and we don't want this situation. I'm going to pull it down until that sits flat, and then I came down to my mark and then traced around and down the other side and ended up needing, like I say, these are inch and a half flange and it's inch and five eighths, so I just made sure and gave myself an eighth there. Anyway, I set the depth of the uh, trim router, just, um, it's not even center cutting actually, just a simple straight cutting router, but, but I did set the backstop at um, one and a half inches from the face to the far cutting side so that when I came over and stopped on the face of the door I, w I knew I wasn't more than an inch and a half and so that's what I did is slid in up one line moved down and came back out and then just cleared that out to that depth um, there's been you know there's been cleaner work in the past it doesn't help when you're near to like highly dense 
areas like that knot and stuff so um it's it's pretty good i'm pretty pretty happy with it and so we're going to stick one two three on here then we're going to take this over to the opening and uh get the door you know at an elevation that we like and put some pieces of wood under it to hold it up there and then just trace those flanges onto the jam and then we'll come in on the jam with that and clear out those areas those mortises for the hinges and we can screw it and, and test the swing and stuff at that point, I'll drill it for a latch and a knob, and then the jam will need a hole for a latch. And, um, and then it'll be a matter of painting everything all out and putting the glass together and then final assembly. So we'll look at that in a little bit. Okay, well, I swear I was trying to do a nice job, but it just is <laughs> getting away from me here. Um, where were we before? Putting in the hinges. I established that I wanted to swing the door this way into this location. Every other place here to swing because I had the freedom to, you know, if I'm going to mortise my own hinges. So since I might have swung, swung this way here, right-handed, left-hand open, um, or right-handed swing here, but I chose left-handed swing as far as this door is concerned. Um, it made the most sense. You want to think about that is my point. And then I quickly, I, so I put in, as we looked at before, the mortise for the hinges on the door and cut and applied the hinge there. Then I came over to the, the opening and set uh, sheets of material on the floor here. Half an inch wasn't quite enough. Three quarters of an inch was just about right. Now the floor goes downhill severely here from the outside wall to the beam that goes through the middle of this uh, building like this. And the second floor beam goes through right up there. Anyway, there's a post there. And there's a post right here at the confluence of these walls. Uh, there should have been a post there, but there's a post there. So that just it's a, it's low in the basement, and so this is low, and so this is low, and so the floor goes downhill. So long story short, uh, we wanted this opening between the two rooms before I came to fix this because look, I haven't even gotten to that low floor problem yet, and uh, and so I made the door opening first, and that has a level top. It's just that the floor goes downhill, so the door is square, and the opening that's left across the top is relatively equal, but the gap under the door changes from brushing on the floor over here, leaving a, a bit of a mark, which you probably can't see. Uh, there it is there, you know, to there being a gap on this side. Anyway, I needed to figure out what was high enough to clear over here, and I guess I was a little bit shy. I'll take a tiny hair's breadth off the uh, bottom corner of the door just so you don't hear or feel that. And um, it wasn't as tall as it needed to be for this uh, jam that went in here. This is a, I think I've remade the top piece, but these two sides are rabbited as if it was a commercially sold jam. Anyway, it went in as three pieces, and it just was whatever it was at the time. And then the door was whatever it is. And frankly, it needs another two inches in height. And I looked at sending it up to where it was correct at the top, and there's a big gap across the bottom, which just this looked worse and this is why i didn't want to put the opening here or it really should everything that i should have done um or that i did do was out of order i should have started with raising that low area and i continue to avoid avoid doing that so i don't want to get off track here but it's hanging it's swinging it's nice and light and you know moves smoothly comes around and stops you know at 90 degrees i haven't got any handles or anything on it right now so i'm just using the open pane i pulled that window stop out of there and i'll be cleaning those pieces up and i've got four pieces of glass ordered um i had to smash this jam over on the rough framing you know there was a bit of a gap behind the jam on this side and i had to pack that over tightly and to get it to go and stay i had to use screws and in the process of tapping it it split because like i say it was manufactured um, but it's probably from one of the mid-century home projects that I did. I took an interior door out of a wall I removed, and so it's, you know, 60, 70 year old timber at least. Anyway, it cracked on me. And so I'm tight to the framing here, and I actually had to put a fresh end on the sole plate because it was a little proud of the last stud, and that little bit was holding us off the stud a little bit, and it was squeezing the opening a tiny bit at the bottom more than at the top, you know, because what you're looking for is uh, smash the fuck out of your fingers. That's what you don't want. We're looking for a consistent gap from eighth of an inch to three sixteenths of an inch so that we have room to swing at the corner of the door slab past the corner of the jam as we rotate rather than moving straight. You need to clear that and overall clearances. That's about all you need. So, but you know, you're familiar with the idea that you don't see that gap when it's all done being installed. Why is that? Well, the last piece of a jam that's actually separate is stop. 
and you can see it on these jams that I built here. No, you can't. I didn't put one on this one because this one always had a sliding slab. Anyway, you can't see through the gap. That's a bad choice. Come on, Jazzy. Uh, over here, I took the slab off, but it did have a swinging slab. Check out my broken washing machine. The parts arrived today. This is the stop, and it's a separate piece. And that you put on to the door when it's closed, so that when the door comes back to home, when it hits the stop, it's right where you had wanted it. You'd always wanted it to be. As my buddy Clifford says, it'll either always, it'll either work or we'll always wish it had. So I bought stop. Um, I normally get a 12 and an 8 because I know because uh, uh, I know uh, I know that a door is a conventional door is uh, rough opening is almost always 82 inches which is 2 inches shy of 7 feet so an 8 footer will always do one side of a jam and uh, you know so 8 feet out of 12 will always ostensibly do the other side of said jam leaving me 4 and 4 will almost always be wider than any you know ordinary man door you're going to put in so the most economical way to buy stop for one door opening in my opinion I thought a lot about this one 12 footer and one 8 and you might say Chazzy what uh what happened? Well, I remembered after I walked out of the store that I brought the car and not the truck. So I made an educated guess as to where I needed to break this and uh, wouldn't wouldn't regret it and snapped it over my knees. Uh, and ultimately, it is the short one. And it won't be quite enough. The long piece won't be quite enough to do one long side. So don't be stupid like me. I was more preoccupied with making it more like four feet that came off of it and I done goofed. And I don't know if that means that this is like a foot short. Somebody lopped a foot of it off a 12 and brought it back because they knew they would get lost in the shuffle. That's fucking maniacal. I don't know if that's actually what happened. Anyway, uh, I wanted to add a piece to the top of the door. Uh, uh, you know, we need a block of wood up here now. Hadn't realized that. And you're saying, probably said five minutes ago, you said, what happened to adding a piece like that when you added to the sides before you had this whole thing sanded and uh, went through all that trouble? <sighs> Man, I wish I had done that. Anyway, we're going to go all the way upstairs and see if I haven't got something nice and thick because I need about two inches, if you know what I mean. Uh, I've got basically two inch LVL, which is plywood, won't do us. Um, almost everything else I've got, you know, in the shop down here. And I've made my peace with the fact that it probably won't be hardwood. Um, I'm going to paint this door. It won't make much of a difference. I suppose it didn't make much of a difference. I could have added two by fours to the edges of it. Um, it hasn't spiraled out of control in terms of cost, but stupid work investment has gotten out of hand a little bit. Now, I wouldn't use that. Oh, look at the size of that. Old slab. He's got to be 12 inches wide anyway and 2 inches thick. Too long. Too nice of a piece for a sign or something else. Nice V-carve into the fresh wood with some gold leaf in there against the aged wood grain and then a coat of poly, you know what I'm saying? So, uh... Dimensional lumber, framing lumber and stuff up there. Inch and a half only. I got some old trim and everything in here. I mean, these are some things that I, they're ridiculous and hilariously small, but I kept because they're over eight, like an inch and sixteenth, maybe inch and an eighth. Long story short, we're going to need to go up. Uh, we can use the other door. That's the beauty of it. We're going to go all the way up to the, to the crow's nest, to the eagle's lair. Uh, the crow and the eagle are estranged, but they still cohabitate. It's the crow's nest and the eagle lair. Out through the plastic vagina. Come with me, kids. Sorry the state of this place in Buffalo in wintertime is a bit... Um... What do we want to call this? Utility frugal chic? Uh, that's probably something better. I could have put more thought We're in the breezeway. This is how you rob me, kids. Nothing's locked. I'm kidding. Everything's locked and there's cameras. Oh, I'm going to start showing you guys more of the estate. People seem to like that. Um, this is the long way around. That's the laundry room from apartment number four renovation and the stairs to the outside. Then you got to come up to the third floor, which in this building is for as old as it is built in the 1890s. Um, it's rad that it's got truss, open floor plan, clear span, um, third floor with a at least a seven foot knee wall. Um, here it is here, there's a door. So there's a door slab, so yeah. Uh, definitely a seven foot knee wall. And um, full turnaround, 
double chimneys. That's a chimney over there that doesn't go through the roof, but here's our rental inventory for theater projects. Material, plumbing, electrical, fixtures, camper toilets section. And what did I come up here for? Oh yeah, got some porcelain stuff here, some remarkable like floor mount, janitor, sink, wash tubs. They would be low. It's nice for a mop and bucket. Um, super chic little motherfucker. Oh, it's a shit. <laughs> I thought it was a chip. I love this little sink. Super rad little hand sink. Anyway, I'm blathering some industrial stainless steel. Must look, must have been something from Sea Line. Anyway, uh, mantles. This is a. Uh, in the breezeway, which we just came through, there was a loading docker that I ripped out when I, sort of early in my tenure here. Uh, and each of these slabs were what made it up. It was just wide enough to kind of walk along. Um, and I couldn't, they're, they're, yeah, they're hard, or they're, excuse me, they're soft wood. They're lightweight. Um, pine of some kind, maybe even dug fir. Um, and they're all about two inches. So I grabbed one of these earlier. You may have seen it when I was blathering before, but I thought you might like this tour anyway. I took it off the top there. Made a little more sense. Here's treated lumber. Drum kit I can't play uh, anymore because it uh, irritates the neighbors. Now, <clears throat> come back downstairs after that totally almost pointless journey. There's the bone yard for the work truck. Um, skid steers. This is going to be a in-law suite someday, living room, kitchen down here, front door, attached garage, and where we came through just now will be a master bedroom or a pair of bedrooms and a bathroom. Can't decide. And here's the skid steer and some more storage and stuff in this area that will be, like I say, like I just said, an attached garage. Ah, oh, mad tangents. I gotta put some water in the chicken coop. There's our moped projects. The one is a cherry, sweet as a nut, as Mike would say, from Wheeler Dealers. Um, however, the other, I'm gonna get that going, and then we're gonna do Airbnb here eventually and offer those as a, an excursion trip. The mopeds, take them for the day. Now, as I said before, I had this here already when we began. And the idea is we're going to plane down the sides of it and take a rip out. That'll make a nice, I'll just be very precise as precise as I can be on the table saw to make a piece that I can add and feather with a little filler or um, sanding and or sanding. And you won't notice. Then we'll paint this out. And then we'll put a lock set in it. And then we'll put the stop on, which we'll put on like I was saying before. We'll come over and we'll stop where we want it to. And we'll stick it on. One, two, three, all pieces all the way around with a bevel at the other side. Oops, it goes narrow aspect facing off the um, jam. And we go over and we just pin it, pin it, pin it, pin it, pin it. Then we open the door, we know it'll be right where we want it to be when we call the door closed. All right, and then we'll paint that out. We'll be back. All right, we got some primer on this. Now, I am a Sherwin-Williams fanboy. It's uh, available in my town. Benjamin Moore is also, and I can obviously go to the box store if I really wanted to shoot myself in the foot. So, as far as um, someone like myself vouching for or endorsing something, I just like everything I've ever gotten from Sherwin-Williams. This is Pro Block. Um, it's an excellent primer. It's an excellent primer for wood and drywall and to cover stains and I basically use it exclusively. I threw it on the door and anything about, um, first thing about brush painting a door is you want to pay attention to the millwork. Our rails and horizontals as installed are brushed, you know, horizontally with their grain and our styles, S-T-I-L-E, our verticals are brushed in their grain orientation. So I generally, because it's a shorter stretch to do all of the horizontals often than it is to do the verticals, unless you've got a massively wide door, I quick brush through all the horizontals and drag it off beyond the grain of the style, the rails grain, and then I quickly brush in the direction of the grain of the style, and I don't know if you can see it here, it's easier to see the grain but not the brushing. That That's and that's 
50-50, the direction of the brush and the direction of the grain are working in unison here, basically, instead of fighting one another. And you see somebody do a sloppy paint job on a door, you'll notice because it's like they didn't get their brush strokes out. It's not that you get them out, it's that you put them where they belong. So long story short, your style always is the full edge, full long side of the door, and all of the rails die into it in both cases. So again, I did all the short runs because it doesn't dry that fast, and then I quick brush through their ends. If it's really a perfect breezy 70 degree summer day in the sun, you will have to brush through and quickly brush across and continue to maintain the cutoff and just leave that much here. And then later when I come through and paint, that'll get lost into the brush stroke kind of direction. Now, this piece that I added to the top of the door has created an aspect that looks better here. It was too thin before. I, I feel like somebody already, this, these, you'll notice that a 15 light door means a full glass light door like this. There's 15 lights in here. But their sizes and the overall size of that group of the windows or the lights, L-I-T-E, um, changes a little bit so that the aspect ratios to look at the door look correctly. And long story short, I believe this group of 15 panes, this I think this was a 32 inch door, uh, 32 by 80 inch door to begin with, and it was cut down because what I ended up adding back, to look at it before, it was way too narrowly framed and the top too narrow for the size of the lights. That overall size smaller door would have had a group of 15 lights I believe a bit smaller. So long story short, um, I'll say that over and over again, but the point being um, is that we've moved to the aspect ratios looking better overall with these lights in here and I added this piece to the top like I said when I started that spiel. Um, you can see from the end grains here that it's different but I brushed through. Now this is the grain is raised on here because the primer is soaking in. I'll probably sand that and I'll brush not only did I brush the primer through to disguise the fact that the grain goes that direction in that spot um, I'll brush the paint through in this orientation as well. And we're going to need two coats on this too. So by the time I'm done sanding the proper grain out, the three-dimensional texture out, and brushing over it twice, um, the way that the light catches, and again, not a gloss, that's another one that you can do, um, step the finish level down to closer to eggshell or satin, um, and it will be nicer, you'll be, it'll be easier to hide stuff. Anyway, paying attention to the direction that I'm brushing, I'm putting a coat of primer on here. I forgot there are glass in these, because on this side, when I got over here, you can see it, but working on this side, it's more difficult. And I was brushing right along, knowing that there's no glass in here, and I got paint right on that. But anyway, I got the ends, all the end grain. You just don't want, you can't do what you can to keep the wood from incorporating and losing, incorporating and losing moisture as the humidity level changes, and you'll have fewer problems. Um, with the fitment of doors throughout the year and catch any drips like these. Now some of these are just repainted drips that existed before. That one is not. This this cross area is like another funky spot to pay attention to and to pull all the drips out of the corners that you can and then um, and then the last move that you make is to brush through it accordingly. Now these the way that these were fit, the horizontal crosses the, the vertical. So while I painted the verticals to get that grain correct, and then I pulled through the little horizontals to make sure that grain in the end um, is the primary direction on those little spots as you, as you look at them. Just as far as theory and doing the best that you can do. In the end, it'll just be whatever it is, and if anybody looks too closely at it, you pop them right in the mouth, and then you point, and you make eyes and then they understand, and then no one speaks. But the point is, we'll flip this and put primer on the other side and come back and paint. Just taking the pieces of window stop that came on the door and reusing as much of them as I can, um, as many of them as I can. There's a couple that broke, and I'm gonna actually try and glue them back together once they're being placed against the glass, because it's hard to glue butt end little sticks together, but um, once they're down in their home, it's easier to make that disappear. Anyway, they're, they're oak to begin with, which is going to be, if I can find it, it'll be more pricey than clear pine. And um, I certainly don't need an eight-foot stick. I may only need a couple pieces out of it. And really, at the end of the day, it's primed in a sense because it's already got paint on it. Um, it's preloaded with perfectly usable hardware. It's hardwood, and it's cut to, to, to length and uh, precisely fits. I mean, despite the fact that I lost the groups of four that were in there together, the idea of millwork is it's always, almost always, 
um, a high enough tolerance that most pieces um, within a door or a window and stuff, if there should be reversible or whatever or interchangeable that they are, that's the kind of tolerance that you're that you're at with um, at this point. Anyway, and I'm going to use Pro Industrial, um, which is a pre-catalyzed water-based epoxy. So it's um, just a matter of drying out the water, and it'll become the epoxy polymer that it is. No part, no multiple parts necessary, and that's because I didn't have um, emerald urethane trim enamel, which is a still it's a hybrid. It's water cleanup. This will be water cleanup, but this doesn't self-level as well. They said, and it's also not usable outdoors. With the way um, emerald urethane is good for indoor or outdoor, no problem because this project's indoors. This color is exclusively used at this. Um, at my place indoors and we're actually trying to use brush um, strokes to disguise some of the grain going the wrong direction on this project so all in all this will work great for this and I can use the rest of it in here somewhere no problem and um, it's a Sherwin-Williams project product I actually went to Benjamin Moore but it was gonna be too much of a pain to get this color made in one of their products without coming home to get a sample so this is we just changed products and stayed with Sherwin Williams. Anyway, I did all this work over a little crevice or a hole uh, to support the material while I, you know, just tapped those nails in the other direction. And now I'm going to put the new glass, 25 bucks for four. Uh, I'm going to put the new glass down into these spots. It should fit right down in there. Maybe when there's more than one and they're not wrapped in paper. Anyway, and then we're going to uh, frame the rest of them, you know, frame them back in. And like I keep signing off on this series, we're going to paint it when we're all done, and it'll be painted. You're going to love it. Can't wait. Hey, all right. It's almost finished, and um, I just wanted to look at a couple small details before I paint them out. One of which being, let's see, we put a closet, a closet knob on this door, which is to say there's no lockable features. Um, it's, you know, something that someone can use from both sides. There's no reason why we would ever want to lock this that I know of right now, although you could change the lockout in the future. Um, setback is the distance center line from the edge of the door. So you have a two and three eighths or two and three quarter, which would have obviously been too much for this door. And ideally the knob looks like it should look like it's centered on the style on the edge of the door. So this being um, an unconventional older door, this is the um, smallest setback that I could get with a circular style installation. Um, any closer to put it any more aligned, you know, centralized on that, you get into a mortise again and you can make a big mortise pocket in the edge and uh, tricky business on the sides. And if you remember, there's a little witness mark there, I filled those um, and it would have been lower and we didn't have access to it anymore after we added wood to the edge. So. Um, long story short, not going to go that route. This, uh, you know, I might have done, I might have really gone to the ends of the earth to make something happen if this hadn't have just cleared, which it does. So, no problem. A little bit of lifting in the veneer there. Um, cracked glass uh, on this one. I'm not really sure what happened there. I ended up putting these pieces back on. Oh, I missed one. Um, with crown staples, half inch long, because uh, I could shoot those. And any other, like, even tapping on the tack. So I backed the tacks all out, all out of these pieces that we saw before. And then I put the piece in place. Um, I didn't, I wasn't so careful as to make sure they went back in the same place. Uh, they were making a new hole when I tapped the tacks, or tried to tap the tacks back in. Some of them went, some of them wouldn't go, because this is oak. And they're really small. And there's a lot of bounce in here. And um, I could back it up for the first installation with a chunk of steel, but on the second installation, I really haven't got a nice big surface to put like a, a chunk of steel against it to back up the, the blow from the hammer. It's all very upsetting to the glass. I don't think this broke uh, trying to do one of those things, but long story short, I opted for shooting in staples because it's a pew, 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 quick and essentially not a lot of trauma to the rest of the assembly. So um, I omitted, I pulled all of the, of the tacks out and just shot crown staples. Um, it's not really easy to see that there's another piece of wood glued on the top. In fact, it's too hard to see in this, um, space and that's good enough for me. Uh, I put the stop on. I like to use a big nail set. So these are just little 18 inch brads that I shot, but it's almost an eighth of an inch in diameter, um, nail set that I used, which isn't here anymore. Um, but I like to make a nice big pocket 
for um, filling, then I don't have to like fight the air bubble behind the fill when I come through on a really, really tiny hole. People sometimes think that like the tinier, tinier the hole, the better, I suppose to some people, but um, I like to just make sure that I've got filler all the way down in there and making a bigger pocket makes that easier, which is in all of those. And I use the lightweight for little things. I use the shrink-free spackling from Sherwin-Williams. And um, I mean, this whole thing is like, weighs a couple ounces, it's so light, it dries really quick. And then uh, QD uh, 1050 Quick Dry from Sherwin Williams is my painter's prep caulk of choice. It is, um, I'm not going to caulk the edges of the stop. I'm going to rely on the paint to close that gap a if there is one. I did have one a little bit, you know, you, as you close the door, you don't want to see any light. And, and the stop kind of obscures the light. But if there's a little bit of an airspace behind the stop, then it's showing again. But when I set these down, use a nail set on these nails, it really pulled that in tightly. And the little meniscus of paint will paint that out even better. Another thing to mention about painting stop is that, I, like I said, I was going to install it when the door closed. was, you know, the slab I had Katie make sure it was nice and flush, and I put the stop up to it. But then I left, if you can see, a bit of a gap. You know, we're looking for a bit of an air gap. Um, it's a bit there, even more. So ten thousandths of an inch or more is nice to have. Twenty thou is even better. Because um, I'm going to end up adding paint to this, and it scrubs. If you notice when this open, it can scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub and make marks on the face of this door over time, or even the first time, just and smear the paint over if it fits too tightly. So over here it comes in and it stops as it latches, but again, kind of hangs out with an air gap, and there's a bit of a jostle there. But drilled the hole, mortised the um, strike, and I'll paint out these little pencil lines. Did some careful pencil I'm not going to go exhaust exhaustively through installing a door here, but we've got a nice little strike plate there. I might hit him with a dead blow hammer to drive the um, curved tail into the trim a little bit farther. This is another good reason not to try to put your trim, get the edge of it uh, coplanar to the face of the jam. A lot of people try, you know, and they feel like the discrepancy there is an error when in fact it gives you the space to do things like to install things like this and it's for good reason also on this side you got to have room for the barrel of the hinge if I was you know tight with the trim there in fact I moved it over a little bit to allow for these hinges um, I just haven't been really careful about a lot of these doors that I built in here because um, generally speaking I had never planned on any of it being permanent or even hanging out this long so even this door for the time I spent and put into it, um, someday we're gonna take this little addition room off and it'll go back to that full height wall. And this entire wall area will have a pair of French doors in it and a transom window, ac window across the top of them. And I'd like to finish them like a, a medium to a dark natural tone on this side of it as contrast the way that these doors are finished in here. And yada, 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 haven't gotten there. Don't wanna spend the money. So free door except um, $50 milling procedure, $25 worth of wood for the sides, and $25 worth of glass replacements that I promptly broke one of. And the paint was going to be additional no matter what I did for a door here. But about $100 for materials here, the same, you can expect to spend $175 to $150. You might get down to $50 for a certain, you know, for a full light old solid wood slab at like a reused place, which is my first thought. But uh, I had the hinges already, or that have been another $10, $15. So we'll come and look now one more time when I've got everything totally painted and it's looking its best, even though it's a bit haggard. There it is. Good enough for now. The nice thing about DIY home projects for myself um, is that I can call it quits whenever I want. And things like this cracked piece of glass uh, that, um, you know, I'd rather it wasn't on the bottom in case the kitten is pawing at the window and ends up getting cut on the edge or something like that, but that's kind of like my only concern. It's a real wooden door, ostensibly. It's had a crack for a long time and no one's gotten to it yet. It adds character, whatever. Um, I could dig it back out of there. I'd have to cut my glass, or cut my paint, dig the four pieces of trim back out, get the piece remade, put it in, put the pieces back, uh, fill and paint the trim again, which is just not something I'm willing to do right now. Anyway, got the stop painted out. 
That came out nice. The back of the jam wasn't painted and it has a bit of a witness and like little bits of hard caulk from where it came out of before that I didn't bother to sand off. But as far as making things look good when there just ain't no way of doing it, I felt like painting around the corner and painting the jam completely against the rough framing was kind of the best um, look for an otherwise piece of finished millwork uh, installed in a rough opening that's too deep for it right now. So since we obviously live with an unfinished um, wall right here, anyway, this was, you know, again, good enough. Love the old glass. I don't know if you're getting any of that. Um, yeah, there it is. You can see a little bit there. And um, there's a fisheye somewhere there. I'm not sure if you can get it right there. Really cool. The new pieces ended up at the floor, which you don't get down here and look, and you don't notice our perfectly clear plate glass. Um, we get all the great, um, you know, old glass kind of looks, and don't notice that the, there's new pieces in there. Bit of a creak. I'll put a dab of, um, what do you call that? Oil? But no, what do I want? Um, penetrating oil. You know, like 3-in-1 or a little WD-40. I'll just tap up the pin enough to get a drop on the shaft of the hinge pin, and then I'll put the hinge back down. Hey, I installed this hinge upside down. What are you doing, Chessie? So the pin will come out downward. This one went in right side up, and this one went in upside down. Yeah, cool, man. It's like I don't, what I know, it's like I don't know what I'm doing, you know? Um, I just didn't care enough, I guess, because I just know this is all gonna get ripped back out of here, but I wanted to get this done. Had a uh, trim repair there, and kind of clean up the floor. Oh, the door stop put one of these jammers on really like those um, as far as the ding 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 ones that stick off of the baseboard I didn't want the cat playing with that um, they do focus the you know it's more of a point load this is a bigger surface and in the end I like those better and look at it kind of disappears given the color turn the flash back off man I really gotta get on oiling that up um, this door had a light duty little like baby knob and a little flippy dongle dink on the other end of it, which is a technical term, um, because it's a lot of these full light doors are like into the, you know, three season room or um, just sort of uh, a way to lightly close off part of a room from the other part of the same room. They aren't necessarily like as far as history goes, they weren't necessarily the way that you had an interior door because usually interior doors, we take a lot of them out now, we're used to that. You have them on bedrooms and bathrooms where you want privacy, but before open floor plans, even when you had a lot of portals and walls with otherwise, you know, doorway openings in them, they didn't have a slab hanging that swung, but there was still a proper opening. And so, as you can tell, we even early on, we didn't necessarily want uh, an opaque door on every interior portal. We would just leave the door off. And then, you know, it became more fashionable and affordable, desirable to think about a full light door as a way to close off rooms that don't otherwise need privacy. And you can obviously put curtains and stuff on it. But the point is, even after I brought this style up to a width that's more in keeping with the group of windows, which we talked about earlier in the video, this is the best I could do. I couldn't get the knob more closely in the center of this. It would have you know, needed a 36-inch door, and then I could have played with 2 and 3 eighths, 2 and 3 quarters, and gotten really close to being on center there. So it's just, uh, or I could have gone back to the drawing board and done a mortise pocket in there again. Didn't feel like it, so I just mortised in the latch. Got a closet knob that has no lock and no anything on either side. And it's all in that darker tone, which is what we're doing around here. And the smash that I did to the jam, I straight up just painted it and we won't talk about it ever again. And that's what happened here. So anyway, you can see places where, there's one of my favorite teachers actually, I'm gonna showcase Mr. Han real quick from the Art Institute, Art Institute of Pittsburgh circa 2006 and seven. Where are you, Mr. Han? There he is. He taught my materials and processes class, and um, every spiel that he did for every machine and every demo project that he did, the overlying theme, overarching theme, was you're going to do a lot better job than I'm doing now. I'm giving you the essentials. So that's what we're in his honor. He's not dead, hopefully. I don't think he is. Um, but in Mr. Han's honor, um, this is how you do this, and I know that you'll do a nicer job than I did. But this will get you... You know, I've got 
the better part of a full week in this, 20 to 30 hours, um, all things considered. And then I had about 100 bucks in, in material cost. And the, the paint was always going to be additional, so I was leaving that out because I might have bought, I might have spent 75 to 100 on the door slab like the right size and then bought the paint and painted it. But in this case, I spent uh, the 50 on the millwork and 25 on the wood and 25 on the glass. So that was the $100. And then the paint again, so it's like 60 for the gallon of paint. Anyway, so less than $200 worth of material cost and more like, you know, $1,500 at least in in time. So, you know, if I were to charge somebody, so I would have told them, let's get uh, let's get the right door right off off the shelf. We'll go to the... We'll go to the store and we'll get what you need. Or even the secondhand store where they've got the right sized door. It just isn't worth doing this unless you're doing it for your own purposes, I don't think. Or if you have a really unique door or it's sentimental. You know, like if this one that I started with had come down from where I grew up and at the old shop and I brought it here and I was so close to making it work, um, I'd feel really good about this. I made a personal investment into this one. I probably won't just chuck it. Like, it doesn't mean anything to me. Someday I'll use it somewhere else maybe. Maybe we'll put it on a show on stage. But, um... That's where I'm at with these with these things. Not economical to go about things this way unless you absolutely have to. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you.